I want to consider the idea of a confidence interval for a second and kind of explain what that means and when we might use it. So basically, in a, if I'm finding a confidence interval, it's because I've got a very large population and I need to take a sample of these individuals to ask them some sort of question. I don't want to ask all of them. So instead, I find a few that I'm going to ask a question to. Now, hopefully those few were randomly obtained and I can get an unbiased guess for whatever it is I'm looking for. Now, I've got this guess and I'm smart enough to know that my guess was not obtained from a census, so it's probably not right, but it's probably close to the truth. So if you'll allow me my guess, plus or minus a little bit of wiggle room, I'll feel much better about it. In fact, if you'll give me more wiggle room, I'll feel even better about my guess. I can be really confident in what I came up with if you allow me enough wiggle room. Now, we don't usually use the ideas of guess and wiggle room or the terms guess and wiggle room. Instead, we might say something like the estimate or perhaps the statistic. And instead of wiggle room, we generally say something like margin of error. Or sometimes you'll see people abbreviate that MOE for margin of error. And so I've got my guess and then I get some wiggle room. And the more wiggle room I get, the more confidence I have in my guess. And if we apply this concept to a lot of different scenarios, we can end up with things that look like this. Maybe my guess was a mean. So it would be an X bar. And if it's a margin of error, then my X bar is based upon my perhaps normal table and then times some standard deviation, perhaps sigma over the square root of N. Or maybe I want to use X bar, but instead of a normal table, I'm going to use the student's T distribution, which would be S over the square root of N. Or maybe I want to find a proportion, and so I use p hat, and that goes back to the nor normal table, but my standard deviation formula looks a little different, looks something like this. Or maybe I want to find the difference in two means. So I've got x bar 1 and x bar 2, and if I were to still use the z critical value, then I would end up with a little bit longer formula it would be look this is not right it would be something like this sigma one one squared over m1 plus sigma two squared over m2 and i could use the same idea with the t distribution there where i have s's instead of sigmas or i could use the same idea with the p hat where I've got p hat 1 minus p hat 2 plus or minus still a z times the square root of p hat 1 1 minus p hat 1 over n1 plus p hat 2 1 minus p hat 2 over n2. In fact, if I wanted to estimate anything, maybe I've got a linear equation and I want to estimate the slope. Maybe that's a T distribution because I don't know sigma. And I don't know what this is, but whatever the formula for the standard deviation or the standard error of that slope, that's the way that formula would look. And so hopefully you can see that there's some sort of connection to what we have going on. In other words, over here, I've always got my estimate, whatever I'm estimating. In the middle here, I've got plus or minus, then I have some sort of critical value, whether it's the Z table or the T table. And finally, down here on the end, I've got some formula for the standard error. And all of those are different scenarios, so they all have slightly different formulas for the standard error. But I think you can see that even if we had something new that we hadn't even discussed yet, if I could just have the estimate, and I'd put that here, 
and I had some sort of chart that was appropriate for it. Maybe it's the Z or the T, or maybe it's some other chart. And then I could figure out this standard error formula. It follows the same pattern every time, provided, of course, that the conditions are met to make inference with this reasonable.